Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final session of the day uh, for our Future Place category. My name is Christine Murray. I'm the director of the Festival of Place. And uh, this is the Festival of Place, the Pineapples, in association with the Design Council. Um, this is our third session of the day, featuring the shortlist for the Pineapple for Future Place, which seeks to recognize a master plan, planning application, action plan, or design proposal for a place, whether in development or for a mixed-use neighborhood, large or small. So we have three more projects to visit today. Uh, each team will have just 10 minutes to present their project to the judges, and the judges will then have 10 minutes of questioning. Um, I will be informing them where their time is up, so uh, don't think I'm rude. It's part of my job here today is to keep it fair by keeping our teams to time. So you'll be meeting our judges in person or hearing from them at least after our first presenter, but I will take a moment to introduce them to you now. They are Magali Thompson, project lead for placemaking at Great Ormond Street Hospital, where she combines her 14 years of experience as an architect with a passion for creating healthy spaces between the buildings. Catherine Max, the health and sustainability consultant of Catherine Max Consulting, who focuses on social and environmental sustainability and reducing health inequalities. And Julian Tollest, who is head of master planning and design at Quintain. He's an architect who went client side and looks to realize the potential of any opportunity from district to doorknob. And thank you so much to our judges. You'll hear how brilliant they are in just a few minutes time. But now it's time to hear our first presentation in this session. And that is from Neil Murphy of Developer Town, who's going to be showcasing Love Wolverton. So welcome, Neil. Thank you very much, Christine. And thank you very much for, uh, uh, for, for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to presenting this to you. I will share my screen. Brilliant. Uh, I'm going to disappear, okay. but I'll, I'll tell you when you have one minute left. No, oh, hang on. Uh, okay, share that, and okay, is that showing okay? Good. It looks um, great, good luck. Great, so um, this is uh, this is the Love Wolverton uh, project. Wolverton uh, is a small town uh, that, that used to be, and it started out as a Buckinghamshire railway town uh, at the junction between what's now the West Coast Main Line and uh, and the Grand Union Canal, and it's now uh, Milton Keynes 12. It's a, uh, it, it's a, a Victorian neighbourhood within the uh, outskirts of Milton Keynes uh, Newtown, and, and you can see uh, the, the circled bit on the right there, um, but um, the sort of the morphology of it is, is in stark contrast to much of the rest of the, the Newtown. Uh, on the top left, you can see our site uh, highlighted in uh, in, in red, uh, and you can see very much the pattern of the old town, which is Victorian grid of streets, uh, and to the north of the town, uh, the railway works, and so very much a, a, a town of two halves, that the works to the north and the and the town to the south, and some of these images on the on the bottom of the slide show you um, what the place is like, uh, 14 metre streets front to front, uh, back of pavement, lovely details of, of sort of uh, Victorian terraces built at the time, and on the bottom right, um, that's the uh, that's the uh, institute building, the railway institute building that you saw used to um, occupy um, part of the site that was destroyed in fire in the late 1960s. Um, this is our site, highlighted in blue, and here you can really see uh, the form of the building that, um, with our investors, we've acquired and will be will be redeveloping. Um, this was. Uh, built in the late 1970s by the Milton Keynes Development Corporation, really as a gift to Wolverton to sort of modernise it. Um, uh, uh, so the the Institute building, which was on the uh, east end of the site, had burned down. Some terraced housing was was uh, bought and cleared, um, and the Agora Centre was constructed. And you can see very clearly that it was basically plonked down in the middle of the street network. And what it did was it severed the main commercial part of the town, north, south in the centre. Um, but south of the building, there's this rather lovely uh, market square that's now kind of hidden from the commercial centre in which we want to sort of restore to the centre of the uh, of the place. Um, so here you can see the building on the left. That's the Agora Centre viewed from the north. Um, there used to be a street that went through there. Um, and because the building was built sort of 45 degrees off its axis, its entrances don't connect up with any of the uh, paths. But it was, in its own way, a, a really visionary building. At one point, it had the largest uh, steel 
uh, reef, I think anywhere in Europe uh, of its kind. Um, and, and as this artist's impression on the bottom right shows you, there was a real idea of, you know, it was called the Agora because it was going to be a place where all life was, uh, a mixture of offices, shops, uh, leisure, including a big central hall that would later uh, uh, function as a, as a roller rink. But unfortunately, it was never viable. Um, the operating costs are absolutely astronomical. Uh, it was never popular, and I think the first petition to have it removed came in the uh, early 1980s, just a few years after completion. Um, so we uh, we acquired the building with our investors in uh, in early 2019, um, and Wolverton's a proud town. We're in a conservation area. Um, it's a really interesting place with a mix of sort of the old railway town population and many new Milton Keynesians who've moved into the opportunity that the place presents. Um, and everybody cares about the future of this of this site. They they want to see the agora gone, um, but they but they also want something that's really appropriate to Wolverton to come back. So um, we held a really interesting workshop where we we built the building in wooden blocks, um, almost to help people understand viability. So the idea that a certain level of development needed to go on the site to make the the scheme uh, feasible. Um, we brought in young people to start thinking about the future of uh, of what the future uh, of Wolverton Terrace might be. Um, we sponsored an arts program uh, called the Agora Go Go program, which really was about getting local people involved in commemorating the building. Um, we built the scheme in Minecraft with a social enterprise called Block Builders and got local kids uh, involved in um, uh, in iterating the scheme. So we had water slides coming off the roof and. Uh, and uh, McDonald's coming in and things like that. Um, and finally, um, relatively late in the day, m most of the projects um, will be will be built for mixed use, um, but 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 rental for the residential. But there will also be a, an older people's co-housing community uh, in there. Um, and we we basically did the design work on that with with members uh, while they were. Uh, uh, while we were in the pandemic and so you know really early experience of doing deep collaboration with future residents uh, online this is the scheme uh, in axonometric um, and so what we're doing i don't know if you can see my cursor but basically on the top left you've got the footprint of the agora center we're reinstating uh the lost street that was under the agora radcliffe street that will reconnect church street which is effectively the high street to the north with the market square um the buildings, um, so we have two architects working on this, Mole Architects and Mikhail Riches, um, and they've effectively designed a two to four storey, mainly three storey, uh, dense uh, mid-rise uh, blocks based around, uh, low-rise blocks based around uh, south-facing uh, courtyards. And you can see from this, the, the sort of prevailing red brick uh, nodding back to the uh, to the to the to the materials of uh, of of Wolverton. Then in the middle here, uh, this is the still green co-housing block. So that was redesigned fairly late in the day uh, to be a sort of tight courtyard apartment block with shared facilities for for still green uh, co-housing. Um, I mentioned it's a mixed use scheme. Um, we've what we've done basically is that the the the, the site had lots of street corner shops, um, and Wolverton is the kind of place that that. Where, where the street corner is where things happen. And so we are putting back uh, a bunch of new small scale spaces that will be flexible. They can be used for retail, restaurants, cafes, um, workspace, um, and uh, and they will really help knit the site back into its surroundings and really kind of animate those, uh, those, uh, those corners. Um, in terms of living environments, um, the courtyard blocks, which account for um, the majority of the development have uh, dual aspects, all, all properties are, are dual aspects. Um, most have um, uh, either, uh, well, sorry, all have either a private balcony or garden or roof terrace, but many also then have a shared courtyard, which basically means that we can give people more semi-private amenity space despite the high density of the, of the location. So overall, it's about 80 dwellings per hectare, and yet half of the scheme is family housing. There are 115 homes in total split about 50-50 between apartments and, and houses. Um, retained plane trees on the site, uh, you can see here on the top left, they're going to have a new public pocket park uh, built around them that will be right next to the square and offer a sort of place of repose away from the bustle. Uh, and on the bottom right is a artist's impression of the courtyard garden that will be built within the still green uh, co-housing scheme, which uh, the residents have themselves um, uh, input into the, the the design of. In terms of sustainability, um, so 
this is intended to be a a, a really strong uh, benchmark for Milton Keynes. I mean, obviously, it's a we ha we're lucky with the location. It's a previously developed town centre site, really near rail and bus, uh, and close to walkable uh, amenities, local shops and services. Um, but one of the challenges, and particularly when you're redeveloping a car park site, um, is dealing with mobility. Um, so. Uh, so we're very lucky to have inherited great connectivity, but we're adding in a new mobility hub with uh, Brompton and Next Bike Hire Schemes, uh, an EV car club. Um, and although there'll only be three residential parking spaces per four dwellings overall, um, they'll all have 100% uh, EV capability, either active or, or initially passive. Um, there'll be a microgrid on the site, um, the diagram on the top left, which will basically generate PV uh, energy to be stored in a battery, which means that over the year, about two thirds of the scheme's uh, energy will be generated on site. There'll be no gas. Um, and on the whole, that should provide the basis for an operational CO2 reduction of about 80% against Partel. Um, there are some trees on site that will be lost, but they're being replaced more than one for one. Uh, nature play spaces in the courtyards and, and so forth, targeting a biodiversity net gain. We're providing for free a youth focused community space developed with a local social enterprise, which responds directly to what the, the young people told us about really having nowhere to hang out other than McDonald's uh, within the town. Um, there'll be retail creating jobs and 30% affordable housing within the, uh, within the scheme. So just to finish then, um, a couple of before and after images really. So um, this is the square. Um, I mentioned really Wolverton's formerly grand public space that currently has the the backside of the Agora onto it. We're going to turn that round, front it with a rather uh, lovely building by Mole that echoes the sort of railway arches of, 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 the, of the old railway town with the ground floor restaurant. And those are um, uh, fully wheelchair accessible apartments above. And you can see the reinstated Radcliffe Street sort of disappearing north on the, uh, on the right. Um, and learning from our own first built project at Marmalade Lane, which has fundamentally worked well because of this rather wonderful car-free street going through the middle, we're, we're incorporating in the scheme two completely car-free new little streets that will be right in the town centre and really provide a place for neighbours to get to know, to know one another, children to play, but also for the, the folk of Wolverton to really feel invited into and part of this, um, this new place. Thank you. Well done, beautifully to time. I'm going to uh, invite our judges to uh, ask their questions now. And I understand Frances is also joining us from town in case um, she would like to respond as well. Um, Magali, would you like to uh, share your thoughts first? Sure, thanks, Neil. That was a great presentation. I particularly liked your uh, the corners being activated by the small sh sort of replicating the corner shop idea in terms of knitting into the existing fabric. That was great. Um, I just wanted to ask you a few questions just related to children, given the large amount of families that are planned to be on, on the site. Um, great to be providing a youth facility for the sort of teenagers who are often overlooked in these kind of spaces. I was, I was interested to see how the ideas of younger children have been put into the design and also the relationship some of the units have to the street in terms of overlooking and being able to keep an eye on your children. And just uh, one further question. Uh, I read in your text how you were able to sort of pull together some of the amenity space that's normally given per unit, which is sometimes quite small to create more meaningful larger uh, spaces, which I thought was really really great actually and I wondered how receptive the planners have been to that slightly different approach in terms of pooling space. Uh, thanks Magali, yeah a uh, great question. Um, so I think that in terms of children and the pooling of space we sort of learned a bit from Marmalade Lane um, which was our previous built scheme which was a co-housing project but where I think we we feel that some of the successes around the way that essentially space has been merged and shared Aren't, aren't critical to, to, to the co-housing element. And so I think particularly this idea that, um, you know, everyone gains from having a little bit less private garden and, and a bit more shared. So that I think critically, you know, we can, we can, you know, rather than just having a great big lawn or something like that, you know, you can actually create nature play, space for biodiversity, you know, bit of space for grown ups to have a barbecue or whatever. Um, you know, it does, it does kind of help um, the, in terms of the the kind of the streets and so forth, we've got a combination of we've got a very urban condition to the north of the site, including some house front doors onto that. 
Um, and you're not going to want your children necessarily playing out on, on that street because it's basically the high street. But then immediately around the corner, we'll, we'll have these little streets that are, you know, not just kind of low car, they're literally no car. Um, and, you know, while again, you might not leave a toddler unsupervised on that street, it provides an opportunity for, you know, for a slightly more neighbourly approach to kind of eyes on the street. Francis, you might but hopefully just briefly comment on this because you live at Marmalade Lane and you can perhaps say how the children use it. <laughs> yes, um, so children here really use it, the younger generation definitely with parental supervision, um, but it enables them to, they're, well they're particularly into scooters and um, bikes without pedals at the moment, the younger generation. And um, we also it's also used as a social space, so it's, it, it tends to, um, ebb and flow depending on what is going on so uh, yesterday a table tennis table was put out and a tournament happened and people walked by with their dogs and uh, said hi and stopped for a while to watch so a, a flexible space I think that people can really start to interact with each other and with uh, people living in the local community. Julian I'm going to invite Oh, thanks, Billy. Uh, Julian, I'm going to invite you to uh, to comment now. Uh, Neil, a fantastic presentation. I, I, I love these schemes which repair the damage done that recent architects and planners have done. So uh, I, I was actually quite gobsmacked when I looked at your existing site plan and thought, who on earth would have come up with the Agora? That, I sort of struggle to find some questions to ask about this because I think you've, you've covered so much of it well. So I've got sort of two points. Um, I noticed when it was recently built, there seemed to be some kind of street market activity that existed outside the Agora. Has, is, that, is that still something that would fit within your thinking? And then the second question, could you just tell us a little bit more about the kind of the operation of the, the micro grid system? Sure, um, so taking the, the first one, um, the, the market historically was held in the square and it was moved uh, to Church Street because essentially nobody could see it on the square because the Agora was in the way. So I think the plan is that um, it has moved back to the square now and it and it will continue to be able to operate there. But also the um, the new bit of Radcliffe Street that we've that we're putting back in won't be adopted um, because the Highways Authority wouldn't let us design the street we wanted if they were going to adopt it. So um, so. Um, and and so and that will be provided effectively with the ability to close um, on the southern bit where basically nobody needs access to parking or anything like that. We can potentially close that for or it can be closed for um, for markets and parties and things like that. So, yeah, it has it has been considered. And I think it's, you know, the aim would be to see that market grow a bit because at the moment, you know, the footfall, you know, you get a kind of double regeneration here because you lose the Agora and you gain what replaces it. I think that's the way we sort of see it. So hopefully the market will thrive. Um, on the on the microgrid, the, the, the current plan, um, although it's sort of subject to a business plan and funding agreement, all the rest of it, is that is that an existing social enterprise called Wolverton Community Energy, which has already done some great work retrofitting uh, on kind of public uh, uh, buildings in the area will will operate the microgrid. Um, they'll sell energy to residents. Um, those who are who are renters, which is about sort of uh, kind of just over three quarters of the scheme, will be on a landlord supply. So in effect, you know they will get they, they will they will get energy from the microgrid. Uh, people in still green cone housing who are buying their their property will have the opportunity to to change tariff if they want. But the aim is to make it not in their financial interest to do so. Um, the, and, and the microgrid should turn a profit, and then that profit will be partly reinvested in um, additional renewable energy projects locally, including to two listed buildings adjacent to the site, which have a very high cost oil-based heating at the moment. So, I mean, we haven't worked the numbers through yet, but the idea is that over time, the, the microgrid should make enough money and, and fit, fit enough additional stuff offsite to actually make the scheme kind of operational net zero, but that might take a few years. Thanks for your question, Julian. Catherine, would you like to uh, put a question to the team? Thank you, yes. I was also going to ask about the market potential, but um, perhaps I can contextualize it in something bigger. Um, yeah, obviously now, get rid of the Agora. <laughs> Wouldn't do that now. That that makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, how much sense it might have made at the time. 
Um, I was interested when you were speaking that when you talked about the replacement street level type stuff, you talked about cafes and you talked about restaurants and you talked about workspaces. And there's a little bit of me that is thinking, are people going to get into their electric cars or maybe get on the train and go to downtown Milton Keynes to do all their proper shopping? Um, so, I mean, that's a tough challenge and that could happen. But um, could you say perhaps a bit more about um, that connectivity and the sustainable transport aspirations and how that relates or does not to um, what will be available for kind of day-to-day -day living um, and buying when you need to nearby. Yeah, so I mean, Wolverton's very much a sort of secondary high street. I mean, it's really lovely. It's full of independence. Some of it's a bit sort of, you know, um, seen better days. But for a place whose sort of shopping offer is basically built on the converted front rooms of houses, you know, it's doing it's doing surprisingly well and it doesn't have a lot of those signals you see of places that are really struggling, you know, lots of voids, lots of bookies, all that kind of thing. Um, so I think that we, we're, we're looking at a few things. I think the first is that at the moment, you know, there's probably a limited amount of people coming to Wolverton. But I mean, MK, to my mind, doesn't have a sort of natural place for to sort of gravitate to socially. And I, I mean, I, I hope it's not too ambitious to think that actually some of the traffic will be the other way. You know, if, so if we open up a tap room and a really good pizzeria, we're actually doing our own tap room in this scheme, which is like a bit of a kind of vanity project, but also because we think that one will really thrive here, um, is, um, is um, you know, can we get people coming the other way? That's the first thing from Central Milton Keynes. Um, the second is, you know, we're putting a lot of housing in here and actually it'll be helping to reinforce demand across the town centre. I think the third thing is that there are existing businesses in Wolverton that have a loyal following across the city and, and Buckinghamshire. And actually one of the things we may be able to do is, is enable some of them to grow sustainably, because in the end, if you're if you're offering operating a brilliant restaurant, but you're doing it from the converted front room of a house, you know, maybe moving into a slightly bigger purpose built sort of thing might might, you know, might help you. So um, I, I hope it will be two way, but I also think that an element of it will be that, you know, Wolverton does have a commuter population to London, to um, to, you, to Central MK. Um, at the moment, the amount of people using the train and the bus for that is fairly low. So hopefully we can help reinforce that. But hopefully there will be that culture of instead of socialising at work, you know, people will come home, you know, they'll pop to the tap room, they'll get a pizza or whatever it is, and, and then they'll and then they'll go home. So. Um, I mean, we've hedged our bets a, bit, bets a bit. We've tried to make sure that those spaces are convertible. I don't think they're suitable for residential, but they could be workspace, they could be health centres, things like that. Um, but but I think our, our feeling is that, and certainly from what we're finding at the moment, there'll be lots of interest and it really will help the whole town, you know, move up a little bit in the value chain, you know. Well, that is your time. So thank you very much, Neil and Francis, for your presentation. Some nice emojis and emoji applause happening for you. Um, and Thanks for having us. <laughs> great. Well, best of luck. And it's time for me to invite our next uh, speaker for today, which is John Badman, speaking on behalf of Callison RTKL for Station Hill in Reading. So hi, John. Hey, how are you doing? Can you hear me OK? I can hear you perfectly. I'll let Thanks you enough. share your screen. Good, you're ready to go. I'm going to hand it over to you. I'll be back in nine minutes. Can you see my screen? Perfectly. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Badman. I'm a principal at Callis and Articale, uh, with master planners, architects um, for the residential and hospitality at, uh, at Station Hill. I'm joined by Canon Ivers from LBA, who's um, uh, one of the leaders at the landscape architect team, and he's gonna join us for Q and A's at the end. I think it's worth saying that I'm just a, a small cog in a huge team that's been involved in this project over the last three years. Um, and our client, Lincoln Property and MGC Investments, have uh, also been key to the heart of that vision. Um, as of the local authority, uh, the local community, and a number of people who've been involved uh, for, for all through all that time. Uh, the project Station Hill is right outside um, the mainline station in centre of Reading, um, 25 minutes to the West End, and now on Crossrail. Um, significant sale scale project um, with regeneration kind of at its heart. And I'll touch on that that context that's driven us to some key aspects um, behind the experience driven master plan that we've we've brought to bear on the site today. You'll note there's a lot of buildings on there. There's some already uh, been demolished um, in recent years. There's been 15 years coming and a number of applications on this site throughout those 15 years. 
And I think from the outset, it's worth saying that the goal was all pretty clear. You know, our client wanted to to would set on producing a um, um, a mixed use city scale development that become a gateway for Reading. And, it, and we set about thinking about that from an experiential point of view and creating a master plan that's place driven, understandable to the people in the community, uh, works at ground level as well as the upper levels um, and has some heritage and the future of place involved in it. And I think when you research Reading and begin to look at it, there's a there's a deep and rich layer of history there that's that's really very evident in the town today. And it's um, it kind of pulls forward the um, the findings from the Vikings, um, but also from the medieval times when the when the abbey was at the heart of the and soul of the town, and the and the monks and the friars were walking between the the churches and the friary um, and uh, the parks, which are there now, which were the which were the gardens. And ultimately, this was all driven as well by, by the trade that happened down the Thames and the Kennet rivers. Then you move to the Industrial um, Revolution and, and begin to think about the three significant factories that were there. Um, the Reading's three Bs, the, the beer, biscuits and bulbs, three big factories that sat within, within Reading. And, and the bit that I find really interesting is the scale of these were were about the same as the um, about the same scale as Station Hill. They they all had housing. They had schools. They had places of worship. They had um, shops. They had markets. And I think they were they were really at the start of that um, that mixed use uh, trend that we really uh, we really kind of embrace and have embraced on this project. But the the fourth B really was about belonging, and it was kind of our objective from the start to set out a scheme that that have ability really to to not just be a place that people kind of live, work, stay, visit, uh, play, but also where they, where they dance, where they meet, where they make things, where they um, uh, collaborate, um, places that you can really begin to belong to and a, a place that be belongs to Reading and it belongs to the community and uh, people feel a part of it. And that was something that was really kind of driving us from the outset. So really we kind of set this collective goal to design and deliver and manage an authentic, thriving, connected urban community, a place for Reading. And I think it's that, that that word manage which which allows us to do that because of because of Lincoln's long-term investment in the project uh, they will be staying and managing the project throughout so all very exciting rich history um, and then bang this is the current view when you arrive in Reading today a seven-story car park um, a three meter level change concrete walls and what I see as an immense opportunity um, but we didn't feel this is quite the way that you should be arriving into a major town of, from Crossrail I think it's worth saying as well, as Neil touched on it with the Wolverton project, that there's there's people commuting into Reading. Uh, there's actually more net people coming into Reading than leaving Reading. It's often thought as a as a dormant, dormitory town servicing London. That's definitely not the case. There's a many, many people that go in there and many more in the future. So we had the existing site plan. We had the car park in the middle, uh, an old shopping centre, which has since closed. But there was absolutely no route between and across the site. And really it was our intention to kind of draw together a master plan which which would allow you to leave the station to enter via this pocket park on a level uh, accessible route pedestrianized route all the way through the heart of the site um, and we bridged over Goward Street which is this road which runs across the middle um, but really the the, the 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 major intervention was to was to demolish the existing buildings the existing car park in particular and put a um, put a level uh, route through the centre of it, and that route was going to be is going to be activated um, with with multitude of different uses, be office residential entrances, um, a, a lot of retail, a lot of F and B, um, a lot of leisure facilities, um, all blurred and blended together. But those edges become very blurred between the between the buildings and between the landscape. And zooming out further, that intervention really we feel kind of pushes beyond just the site boundary. It pushes into um, stretching through to the existing Friar Street and Broad Street where the shopping is in Reading and linking down to the Oracle and really the linking of the two rivers as the, the route under Reading Station begins to become evident as, uh, as the master plan plays out. And then so in three dimensions you begin to see that route and the, uh, the height around the station which is part of the planners uh, intentions and their framework um, which begins to set out this public square in the middle. So Really, again, it's been this, this place where you can exercise, where there's an art strategy coming forward. We have independence uh, sized shops and, uh, and F&B units. We have places for markets, places for people to meet, to play, fountains, slides, um, places to watch watch films, to have flower festivals linked to those the Sutton Seeds and those, those sorts of things. And so now when the view, when you arrive on the concourse at Reading and look down over this, this new pocket park and look through into the center and the heart of the scheme, the intention is that we really kind of 
take these spaces and really benefit from the, the sunlight that they get, um, providing play, climbing walls, slide down there, um, uh, the steps up from the tunnel, which comes under really kind of an advantageous way to, to mediate this level change that we were beginning to deal with. And this was a place really kind of seen as that, that people would sit around and enjoy when they're waiting for a train, uh, mixing office workers with tourists, um, visitors, people on skateboards, with bikes, with walkers, with prams, uh, to be able to really kind of integrate that. And these the office buildings uh, designed by our friends at Gensler um, really, you know, was about lifting lifting up those lower floor facade to enable those spaces to bleed into the uh, to bleed into the public realm, the public realm to bleed back into the buildings and create this very permeable space. Then we go around into the main square, where at the centre of it is a uh, is this um, this main space, which is really we call kind of call the stage, which is half grass and half half hard land landscaping, with the intention here for to kind of redirect people around it so that they pause and reorientate themselves push to the edges of the space where they, they've got places to dwell, places to shelter, places to watch, to see, um, places to, to meet and to greet um, and look at this activity of people. And really this is, this is the meeting of the rivers, the joining of the rivers, this flow and this tide of people and these eddies and spaces around it, which are covered and, and allow people to sit and rest around it. And it's really at the heart of that scheme that we begin to see the different spaces that we're, we're kind of beginning to shape that we can we can put into those into that main square for performance for for cinema for markets for ice skating whatever whatever it may be really flexible space um, set around the stage to begin to encourage people and become kind of the heart of the scheme and then as you move from the pocket park through the main square down what is uh, Friars Walk a new street that we've integrated in to join the old historic scale of Friar Street um, where much more independent shops uh, the main residential elements will be with courtyards overlooking that space. So I think really Station Hill's been that master plan that's been it's been crafted around life. It's designed to kind of uphold the importance of place. Um, and with that, with the density that we're proposing here, which is um, 1,200 homes, about 600,000 square foot of, of offices, a uh, 200 bedroom hotel, there's about 60,000 square foot of, uh, of retail and uh, F&B, non-residential, non-office spaces. Um, all allows us to give this opportunity for kind of lively experiential interactions. And I think working close collaboration with, with the whole team and the clients, the local authority, uh, the, the residents, the, the public exhibitions that we've held, um, the numerous meetings we've held with, with other stakeholders, we're looking to kind of create a memorable, inspiring backdrop to, to let the people become the colour and energy of this scheme and to really kind of uh, to let it thrive something that's been waited for for a long time i hope that was within 10 minutes if i haven't you been were i think were it is <laughs> absolutely within 10 minutes well done john um yes emoji applause for timeliness and a whirlwind tour uh absolutely uh brilliant to uh to visit Station Hill with you. I'm going to invite um, Catherine uh, to to put her questions to you first. So Catherine, thank you. Hi, thank Catherine. you. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. Um, yeah, arriving in Reading is pretty grim. Um, you're right about that. And um, certainly what you're proposing in terms of the kind of landscaping. And, well, I mean, it's a bit mean, be hard for it to be worse, but it's clearly going to be better um, in, 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 in that regard. Um, you you talked about the importance of heritage and Reading has a long and layered history and you talked about belonging. Um, this is a little mean, but I didn't get a strong sense of what was going to be distinctive about this design. Yeah. Um, it, it kind of could be anywhere. Um, so I'd really like you to sell that to me more and, and perhaps related to that. Um, this is downtown Reading. It's not going to be cheap. That's how it goes. Um, is it realistic that there will be more independent shops and outlets there? Um, and, and what's going to be in place to make, make that likely? Catherine, great question. We love it when people say this could be anywhere. So um, I think one of the things is, is this is a this is an outline application, which the first phase is in the process of, uh, of just starting on site, which is a which the detail application has been completed. That first phase is is the residential elements on the south south of the site. Um, there's a place making playbook which is in place um, to ensure that all the things that I've touched on in a very brief presentation there um, can be delivered and that those are 
are community driven that they um they bring forward the um the spirit of reading and the people of reading the plan is to enhance the um the Friar Street and the uh, lovely alleyways which run north south through Reading. I'm sure if you know the town, you'll, you'll know those as well. Um, you know, there's a real opportunity to kind of reach way beyond the red line boundary. I think the materiality point is um, is interesting. There's um, our, our real focus has been to really look at the kind of those lower floors and to bring that that detail and that integration into the schemes. And, and the, the the residential certainly does. And the the lower floors, I think, was a very brave decision by Gensler to go forward with a with a with a scheme which really the the end the inside of the building is the elevation on the lower floors which I think is going to be uh, hugely exciting so um, I think one of the big opportunities we've got here is that because Lincoln are in this for the long term um, there's a lot of frameworks that we've set up to allow it to be not just anywhere so those frameworks which sit which is a which is a playbook a um, an art and cultural strategy which is coming forward um, districts who are the, uh, the the leasing agents have been really looking hard into what is an affordable space for an independent to, to rent, what is the scale of that space. Um, they've actually been involved from the outset. So I think something that's been really positive about this scheme has been the deliverability of it. So um, as a client, they've tested us all the way through to say, well, that's a really interesting concept. Can it actually happen? <laughs> so. So to be able to begin to look at how the financials of that sit around to enable us to actually deliver on it has been really critical. Um, and it's a, it's a scheme which is going to take, you know, a while to get built. It's not going to arrive next year. Um, but the flexibility is in there to enable those those different uses to and the different curation outside in the public spaces to be really beneficial to, to everybody, the whole community, really. Thanks. Julian, would you like to quiz John? Hey, Julian. Hi, John. How are you doing? Cameron, nice Good to thanks. see you. How are you? Nice to see you. All right. Um, it's a theme which I've asked in a couple of the earlier presentations, but I mean, obviously, the principle of opening up that that principal route through the through the urban block makes a lot of sense. So, you've basically got a scheme which is resi and and office space with mixed use ground floor. I'm assuming that the sort of publicly open the, the public open space is is still privately operated and maintained. So uh, my two questions really are, uh, how, how does that work uh, in in this sort of mixed use scheme? I mean, there were some lovely CGI's of people, you know, relaxing and enjoying it, but how does it work, you know, after dark, after things have shut down? And secondly, you talked about a fantastic location being only sort of 30 minutes commute to London, but it, I heard the point about a lot of people commute back in. Yeah. I mean, we're, what sort of space is there for the residents of this scheme? You, you mentioned uh, residents' gardens, but I'm, I'm looking to see where their their space and their respite space is in such a sort of a, a dense city centre site. So, Julian, if I can if I can start with your second question, then I'll ask Canon to answer your first question, if that's okay. Um, so, in regards to the residential, um, the, the first first phase is um, just shy of 600 units. Um, it's all, it's all going to be built to rent. We've got roof gardens. We've got a intense amount of amenity across the whole site, including a lot of ground floor, um, which is going to really allow us to kind of activate it. We're, we're, we're looking to bleed that amenity into concessions for different retail offers as well. So it's a true kind of mixed blurred space. And um, there's also amenity up on the upper floors, um, balconies um, everywhere and roof gardens um, across across all the schemes the 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 intention is for phase three which is which is probably the next residential element to come forward is um is there's there's options there for very very flexible permission for um it may be later living it may be built to rent it may be for sale it may be um co-living it will probably have a hotel in it there's going to be a much more mix of uses but the 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 deliverability of the scheme is based on bringing forward the residential and office in the first instance, and then allowing the flexibility of phase three to come on to come on from there. Canon, I'm hoping you're on. I can't see you, but I'm hoping you're on. There he I is. I am here, Julian. Good to see you, John. Well done on your presentation. But I think it's it's one of those challenges of any development like this, Julian. You'll know from Wembley that making sure that these are lively, active spaces, even though they are privately owned, is something that our client Lincoln has committed to, and it's something that they would want to take forward to own to allow to evolve also that's the other point that i think it's important here is that trying to find something that is place specific often comes through the life and the activity that happens there 
we can't get it right on day one, but certainly making sure that it has the the stage or the platform or the scale of space that allows those kind of events to take place, first and foremost, was what we were trying to achieve. The mechanics of that, obviously, how do you make sure it's safe? How do you make sure it feels public? How do you make sure it doesn't feel over surveillance in the sense that it doesn't then feel like it's a place for the people of ready and then for the people that are visiting or, or passing through is of paramount concern, I think, for everyone. But certainly at the heart of this is a commitment from Lincoln, a commitment from Reading as well to see this as not just a development, not just a, a new public space for Station Hill, but something of a space on a scale that Reading could celebrate something of an event that we saw last night through Wimbledon, those sorts of things, that it can become a new destination, a new landmark that pulls people to that space and allows everyone to come together. How you, how you deal with that in the evenings, obviously this is a space you would never close off. It's a major thoroughfare, it's a major connection. So you'll have natural surveillance, no doubt from what's happening at the ground floor and the residential overlooking it. But you're right, there's elements that we have to certainly make sure in place that it feels like it is a genuinely public space in, in, the, um, in the civic sense. Hope that answers your question. Magali, I'm going to invite you to uh, put your question to Ken or John. Um. Great. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was uh, interested in your layers of history that, and the beer biscuits and bulbs and the, what you spoke about in terms of the factories and the communities that built up around those factories in quite a natural way in terms of sustainability communities, if you like, living around uh, the, the, the factory, if you like. And I was wondering how, you know, a similar approach might have fed into the mixed uses at ground floor, especially for the residential blocks. Uh, and yeah, whether you, what kind of consultation you might have carried out in terms to, in terms of informing what those ingredients are. Um, yeah, I was going to ask a bit more about that because I think it, I think the public realm is really, it's great that it's acting as a canvas for all these different activities to happen on it. I guess there's a slight concern that if it's your home, how, how do you kind of balance that with a sort of the slight containment or protection or, or, or privacy that you might require in terms of it being your home as well, if you like. Go, Canon. If we can hear you. Yeah, no, I think that's one also for you to jump in, John. But um, I think certainly there's elements that we would try to draw parallels from what those communities were about. And often it was about meeting your neighbor in those moments when you wouldn't expect it, those incidental encounters that ultimately is what builds community and brings people together. This is largely a build to rent scheme as well. To, so to, to acknowledge that there is that sort of uh, mechanism in place as far as the types of people that you might see initially starting the scheme off. Obviously, this once this becomes a brand new route into the town, you're going to have a huge amount of footfall that's also drawn through the center of the space. So how that can start to inform what those ground floor uses are, I think that's one John can pick up on in more detail, is how do you give it that authentic place specific identity, because I think that's also what Catherine was asking is how do you make sure this doesn't look like a chain of shops that we would see on on yeah. every other high street? It's how do you find those elements where you have genuinely worked with someone that has has the impetus in Reading to, to have a footprint here and to have an identity on that main route? I think I think I'd add as well um, that the, the, the mix of those uses and the interface of those uses is is deliberately close and tight knit then there are spaces within the residential uh elements of the scheme that are more private and that are set back through courtyards behind the facade that you don't see from the public streets so um we do actually have some front doors off the off the scheme now is that there's some there's some front doors with duplex units going up and some defensible garden spaces which run right along the main street which which was pretty difficult thing to get our head around, but I think it's hugely exciting because it's gonna, it is gonna, you think of those factories and how they did have steps coming down and then the, the flurry of people and the, the, the pace of people coming through, um, you know, I think is, is gonna be a really exciting thing. And I, I would just note as well that the, the scale of the spaces which are coming at the ground floor, um, one thing that we've been really careful to do is to create this framework to allow that to actually happen. And um, I think the authenticity of the uses which happens at those ground floors, um, for example, there's a lot of talk about 
creches and it's not just coffee shops and bike maintenance cafes which yes we're going to have but it is um it is about um you know family orientated elements as well it is thinking about who lives next to a crossrail station you know that is another aspect of this it's, it's it is a dense urban environment it's a rental product if people don't want to live there they won't live there but the provision that's being given to people for for to entice them and to in, to create that community is extensive so the, the curation around the management and the and the um the the events that are going to be put on both within the residential on the street outside in the main square around the town are going to come to the fore and because of the scale of it you know we've got about two and a half thousand new people going to be living here we've got about six and a half thousand new jobs coming i mean there is a density of people that is coming that is going to really this isn't just putting a new street through Reading, it's putting a new community in the heart of Reading to help it really kind of uh, benefit as a whole. I've appeared to tell you that that's your time. So thank you very much, John. Thank you, Kenan, for joining us. And thanks thank for our judges for their brilliant questions. Thanks very so much. Now it's time for me to introduce, yes, please, some emoji applause for everybody who's contributing today. It's amazing to be traveling all over these um, schemes. Uh, it's now time for our final um, presentation from this category of Future Place, and that is Stratford Master Plan, which is going to be presented by Andrea George from Bruntwood Works. Hi, Andrea. I called you Hello. Andrea. <laughs> That's okay. More. Either way. <laughs> nice to meet everybody. Um, so, Andrea, over to you, and I will be back in nine minutes. I'll wait till you've shared your um, screen and are comfortable to go. Thank you. Wonderful. Can you see that? Yes, it looks perfect. I'll see you soon. Yeah, excellent. Wonderful. Thank you. So, Stratford Town Centre is currently dominated by a gradually empty 1960s shopping mall surrounded by busy roads. There's natural disconnection, Chester Road and Kingsway Roads sever the mall from the rest of Stratford and create dangerous and uncomfortable crossings for residents. Um, the roads create noise and pollution and there's no public realm. Our plan is for a connected town centre integrating residents, workers, parks, civic uses, public transport and the canal. The proposal will diversify the current retail, leisure and residential offer by invigorating the high streets and delivering up to 800 new homes. Um, the new network of streets will reconnect the surrounding context with the new area and new squares will be defined by retail or homes, for example, and will consolidate the character of each area and the new open space will contribute to the new residents' well-being and offer a place for people. Uh, the town as we know it today uh, started to emerge upon the arrival of the Manchester Ship Canal in 1894 and the subsequent development of the Trafford Park Industrial Estate. Uh, the pair both had a substantial effect on Stratford's growth and many of the workers were housed in terraces running off the central main high street, King Street. Before the Mount, Stretford was centred around this bustling high street, which offered the convenience of local shopping, leisure and work, and was you know, truly the centre of the town. And Stretford is a real strong place identity, which can be utilised by integrating the heritage assets on the periphery. Having a guess, I'm just changing the slide, sorry. That's fine. Uh, so the starting point for change is putting people at the start of the conversation and keeping them there, right at the heart of the centre of it. And that standard is something we've been particularly responsive to when it comes to our work at Stratford Mall, with peerless community engagement at the core of our partnership. Um, an event was held at Stratford Mall in January 2020, which was well attended, uh, gaining over 3,000 interactions with residents. Through various workshops, interviews and forms, residents were given the opportunity to express their initial thoughts on the master plan. The results of the consultation were used to deliver an initial master plan approach uh, within a well-knitted and connected community. Another major strength of our joint venture partnership has been in detailed data-informed learning. Deep research, together with public consultation, which is led to hyper-local understanding of human and consumer behaviours that will allow resilience and flexibility for the future of Trafford. This master plan, uh, very second, 
Uh, this master plan aims to reimagine Stretford into a place for people, creating a sustainable town centre with a rich variety of uses and services. This is an opportunity to redefine a large part of Stretford, stitching the community together within a new town centre and mixed use neighbourhood, comprising high quality contemporary architecture and innovative public spaces. Whilst flexibility, connectivity and evolving retail demands that are supported by technology are essential to the high street, we almost must remember that the future high street has the same values as the high street of the past. Thriving independent places where localism isn't just about convenience and comfort, but offers a local distinctiveness that attracts others to the area. Building on the existing provision for that vibrant community to flourish is a core principle of the project. Both the existing surrounding community and the future community of residents will be able to mix through the use of public open spaces, food and beverage spaces, retail civic uses and other social opportunities found on the site. We're carving up the existing monolithic shopping centre and we've identified the heritage, community and cultural assets with, that we'll re-establish within the town uh, centre experience bringing the library into the heart of Stretford, which will create a social hub the community needs. The site is located, uh, it was very well connected area in actual fact, there are also plans to improve cycle infrastructure and connectivity in the area, most notably along the Chester Road and the border that borders right to the east. The emphasis uh, of our master plan is on ensuring social, economic and environmental sustainability. This has been backed up by winning nearly £18 million pounds of uh, future high street government funding, which will ultimately help us in achieving high quality infrastructure and a resilient public realm. Specific plans include the reinstatement of the historic town, uh, historic King Street as a thriving high street and developing a maker's yard hub for small independent retailers and restaurants with outdoor seating, eateries and bar areas uh, to provide up to 800 residential homes, including affordable homes, to unlock the connection between the town centre and the canal and to open up the waterfront area. We plan for a series of interlinked public realm spaces to create green meeting areas with public squares and open spaces and a green biodiversity corridor, including a library square and central park at the heart of the town centre. Play features high in our plans with the creation of destination play spaces. We're working, with, uh, we're working to be inclusive, to build back better and to create shared spaces for the community, including allotment initiatives, the idea of a rooftop village, public toilets, water fountains, designing street furniture to accommodate uh, disabled residents, providing accessible amenities rather than keeping them locked away. We also want to work with our climate, creating shelters for sun and rain, but also maximising the potential for spaces that don't become unusable when wet weather, but instead become more playful. We'll transform Stretford Mall and the surrounding area into a sustainable retail leisure centre by offering flexibility of use through combining units or subdividing. The roof of the mall will be removed and we'll install solar street lights, incorporating rainwater harvesting and district heating to reduce bills for residents. Uh, and within our retail portfolio, we'll promote a living wage and focus our attention on ethical retailers. Creating a living environment that is safe and inclusive for people of all ages is a concept that is central to our vision and will encourage a diverse mix of people who choose to live here by providing a diverse offer of home types that range from apartments to townhouses. The development of uh, competitive, sustainable and inclusive centres uh, should be underpinned by collaborative leadership, building on the knowledge, culture and cultures of the people at its heart. On one hand, retail relies on footfall from both residential and workspaces, but on the other, it provides essential and desirable amenities to the residents and workers. The retail itself should be such a strong, unique and experiential offer that when coupled with convenience, of working where you live, it adds up to a great, a great place to be. At the centre of our town centre strategies is the importance of public realm, layering, uh, layered with experience. It's the squares, green spaces, parks and plazas that serve as the connective fabric weaving together the threads of the town and its people. This project adopts uh, the neighbourhood creation framework designed by our architects, Fields and Clegg, 
And these principles interrelate with the National Design Guide to create places which respond to their context, design people-friendly streets and open places, craft modern houses which feel like home and offer choice and diversity. Creating a great public realm is a major goal for us as it directly affects the health and happiness of its community. So we're readdressing the balance of space and we'll create public spaces that will better contribute to the character of Stratford. Use, uh, we'll use community and residential spaces to enliven the town centre, provide accessible public realm amenities and access for open space and for new and existing residents. We're reconnecting people with their place. The 20 minute neighbourhood is being carried through the, to the design of the spaces and the movement between them. We're looking to improve the legibility within the town centre through the use of high quality materials and we'll highlight key views uh, of the centre for residents to enjoy. We'll reintroduce activity and biodiversity by designing spaces with the end users and event programming in mind to maximise use and activity throughout the day, the week, the year. Uh, we're creating new green links through the town centre and we'll provide art and temporary installations throughout the public realm so there's always something new to see. And by 2028, our Trafford Park portfolio will be recognised nationally as a blueprint for sustainable technology enabled, well built town centre ecosystems with a significant contribution to employment inclusive growth. High in our priorities is the commitment to Brookwood Works pledge to reduce absolute carbon production by 50% by 2030, aligning with our JV partner, Traffic Council, and their own commitment to be carbon neutral by 2038. And implementing that in Stretford by aiming for a self-sufficient town centre with solar street lighting, district heating systems, local energy uh, networks, and providing uh, and approaching all of our refurbishments with net zero carbon in mind. The purpose of this project, we have adopted the One Planet Living Framework, the creation of a substantial and connected green infrastructure network that links into the wider context will create a rich ecological and robust backdrop to Stratford. New green infrastructure corridors are to be used for both the establishment of a variety of ecological and conservation initiatives and the creation of successful ecological communities. We've used the solar orientation of the site to maximise south facing green spaces and with blue infrastructure it's equally important uh, that that layer complements and enhances the green infrastructure strategy. We will include rainwater harvesting, permeable surfaces that allow water to so slowly filtrate to the ground. And one have minute, water Andrea. For fun, for fun minute. and experience in the public realm. <laughs> We're at the outline planning stage and we've got loads um, of plan community engagement before detailed designs are worked up and submitted. And that concludes the presentation. <laughs> I am happy to take. I'm happy to take questions. I'm glad I got to the end. <laughs> Brilliant. Well done. So, so I'm going, sharing. Yes, thank you. So I'm going to invite you, Julian. You've got quite a lot of experience with um, shopping, I know, on the Wembley site in particular, uh, with the part mall and part not shopping mall. So um, would you like to come in and, and, and quiz Andrea? Yeah, Andrew, thanks very much. Fa uh, fascinating presentation. I've also been looking on Google Maps whilst you've been sort of chatting, so I, I, I kind of get I get the context of the place. Um, there's something quite fascinating, I think, in in this, and there, there is a relationship to my experience of Wembley, is that, you know, um, you, there's a kind of interesting embodied carbon story here, which, you know, we, we've just seen a couple of schemes which are taking the challenge of, you could say, recently constructed uh, retail offerings, and essentially demolishing them uh, just to put back an old street pattern. But the this concept of the shop park play aspect of the multi-story car park, could you just tell us a little bit more about that? Because I, I, it it seems quite a fascinating point, and I, you know, it's very topical. The issue yes. of you know the IR the R, the IRBA sorry RIBA talking about you know don't presume that the first thing is demolition. And I just wondered if you could just expand upon that a little bit more. Yeah, so we've been working with uh, Ramble in actual fact, just to, to work through that across the scheme. Uh, you know, where is it that we can reutilize um, and reuse as opposed to new build? Um, now, 
the actual scheme itself, the mall, you know, was half a million square feet in its heyday, and it was then made. I think it was reduced to three hundred and fifty, and we're at right size in the retail again. So there will be an element that we will need to demolish to make way for residential and and other uses, green spaces, etc. Um, but for right size in the retail, we actually propose to take the roof off the um, uh, the shopping centre to re-establish the King Street. Part, partly it's outside already and the rest is actually within the centre. Uh, so to take that off and to replace the shop fronts um, and actually because it was built in the 60s, it's got quite a regular uh, pattern, which means that when we do any interventions, what we're trying to do is build better for the future. So making sure that we've, we, we uh, think about extract routes and duct work and uh, grid patterns so that you can ebb and flow with the market being able to go from retail to um, uh, hospitality use and back again, you know, is, is very useful. Being able to, you know, uh, have workspace as well on the ground floor is useful. We can ebb and flow and hopefully future proof. Uh, in terms of the actual um, multi-storey car park, um, that's a really interesting one because we've got double height spaces on the ground floor that um, are currently used for servicing. Um, where we can incorporate, a, we're looking at an indoor market in actual fact, albeit that it will have, um, it, it'll only be indoor because it'll be a route through, um, it's sort of an L shape, if you, if you know what I mean. And so it'll be, it'll be gated off as opposed to sort of closed off. Um, and I think that's a really interesting use. And we can also bring the library uses into the car park. And on the, on the, the um, on the top, on the, on the rooftop, um, what we're doing is we're talking to the community, trying to find out what, what, where were the gaps in the market. All along this consultation period, we've said that we're the facilitators, it's not our town, it's your town. So what is it that you want to see from your town that we can then help with? So antisocial behaviour, I suppose, is, a, is, a, is an obvious one. And therefore, you know, how can we deal with that? So what we've looked at, and we're still in consultation, is, is providing there are no five-a-side football pitches, for example, in Stratford. Uh, and that's a, a great use that goes both from, you know, toddler children right up to adults. Um, so, you know, that that use. Um, we've got a meanwhile use uh, with a cafe um, that will be pop up and, and cinema experiences. Uh, we've got planters. We couldn't get allotments, so we're too heavy, <laughs> but we can get uh, planters up there. Um, so we've got lots of different community engagement. Um, like the challenge is that you know a car park's built to be a car park um, and you'd think that they would be bomb proof wouldn't you that they'd be as sturdy as anything and, and they are but you know loadings will be an issue and we're just trying to work through that at the moment uh, you know as, as well as fire strategies but where there's a will there's a way. Brilliant. There's a comment I'm going to address just before you put your uh, next, uh, I, I put the next judge on you, but Matt Pickering has said um, in the chat that he's a local and he's really happy that Brentwood and Trafford are taking on this proposal, but the um, severance caused by Chester Road uh, being overcome and links to the canal are key to the success of this scheme for him. So I wondered whether yeah. you wanted to address uh, whether uh, his dreams will yeah. be fulfilled. <laughs> yeah, no, hundred uh, percent. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, it's a, uh, it's essentially a dual carriageway. It is, it's ginormous, and um, and the canal is beautiful. Uh, well, actually, it's not that beautiful at the moment, but it will be. Uh, you know, uh, and on the, when you get onto the canal, you can walk, cycle, push a pram, whatever, up to Manchester City Centre, and then also in the other direction to Sale Water Park. So it's a, it's a very nice, safe environment. Um, that we really want to open up to Stratford. Um, and so the way that we are, we're working actually uh, with Traffic Council on the area action plan. Um, so we, we feed into that and make sure that there's permeability and, and, the, and there's cohesiveness for the whole of, of the whole of Stratford. So what's already happened, there's lots of devastation around uh, COVID, of course. But one of the great things of COVID is that one, it's brought the community together, but it's also um allowed Chester Road to be traffic calmed already so now we have cycle lanes uh both on both ways essentially um and that's already sort of had the, the desired effect of um of, of traffic calming in addition to that uh we are creating a level of uh planting um both from uh, trees and also shrubbery to give you an extra layer um so you've got the car then you'll have the bicycle then you'll have 
um, greenery, and then you have pedestrians, and then you'll have shops. Um, and so it feels like that order is is all the time. It's layers of disconnecting you with the pollution, uh, you know, of Chester Road, and and that it's a very fast road as well. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing is uh, really looking at the crossroads from the canal um, into King Street and, and, and making a better linkage and a more enjoyable user experience. And th I think that's the way that we are framing everything. It's, it, we're looking at human behaviours and uh, consumer behaviours and, and, and putting their hat on first and, and walking it as you would as a pedestrian who lives there, a resident, and ha how can we make that connective better and then when you get onto the other side of the canal there will be a host of residential units um, but there will be cafes on the ground floor to really um, draw people down there and whilst you're there enjoying the canal you'll also perhaps stop for coffee um, or have your bike fixed or whatever you, you might want to do whilst you're there. Great, I have to give it back over to my judges. Magalie, I know you have experience with wanting to separate uh, citizens from air pollution and, and traffic as well, but I'll, I'll ping it over to you with whatever question you'd like to have. Sure, thanks, Andrea. Um, it was really great uh, presentation and I really like all the diagrams. There's so much going on there. Uh, really positive to hear uh, mention of water and toilets in the public realm, which are um, not talked about often enough, I don't think. Um, so I really liked it. I guess that I was interested to, th there's almost so much going on that I'd be interested to see how that balances with sort of creating a home and sort of residential aspects of living in the area. And also keen to see how it knits in further in, in terms of the surrounding neighbourhoods, you know, outside the boundary, if you like, of the site that you're looking at. Yes, and so we've done that, um, looking at permeability in the first instance, how we can link the areas together so it feels cohesive. Um, and then we've also looked, I, I call it sort of a gentle gradient, if you like, in terms of massing. Um, so around the residential homes that we currently have, there'll be similar massing um, and then working up to um, Chester Road, which is, a, you know, as I say, a, a, a main road and therefore the massing could be higher, um, but the gentle gradient is no more than um, six or possibly eight storeys, uh, even there. So the, 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 we've got respect for you know streetscape, how you create those linkages, um, where they are pedestrianised, what are the views at the end of the street, residential area, which is St Matthew's Church, um, you'd expect you know low density, low uh, low rise. Um, but as you go closer to either a main road or to the main shopping areas where your densities can go up. Um, and the other thing that we are creating uh, is a series of parks um, and they will be both, you know, we talked about green, uh, blue, uh, but also just looking at how we might be able to create shelter um, for, um, for rain. You know, we want to promote people coming out of their homes and using the park even when it's wet um, you know so that we don't have everyone just staying at home when it's you know until until it's dry so it's uh, overcoming those um, issues that will integrate uh, the community even more and so what we're trying to do is create levels of activity so you're literally there from you know it's an ecosystem essentially um, and so there's always a reason to be able to go to your own town centre and it's and it's not retail driven any longer. It really is being part of a community, being part of the town centre, enjoying your public space. And whilst you're there, you may grab a coffee. You know, you may decide after a glass of wine, you might go back to that pair of shoes that you keep looking at. You know, or you know, if you if you live there and work there, your, your balance uh, is 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 to, uh, your life live work balance is better. So we're very much Andrea, I have to jump in things. because I, I really want to give Catherine the opportunity to ask a question and okay. we're, we're running to the end of your time. Uh, but go ahead. Catherine. OK, thank you. Well, in a way, I wanted to pick up on some of the things you were just starting to, to talk about. Um, so, um, yeah, there is a lot going on. Um, uh, and you, you did just say, oh, it won't be retail driven, but you'd end up buying a coffee and a pair of shoes. Um, yes. So uh, it would be good if you could say a bit more about what 
the offer is going to be there that's yes. not where you're not spending money necessarily yeah, yeah. um it could be cultural it could be hanging out um yeah what might you do for free yes well so for free um it, in the first instance we talked about the, the library and having that as a social hub for the community um the public spaces uh we will have um community events on um the there will be seating that you can sit out with having to buy a cup of coffee um the, I, when i talked about the retail i meant that that was like a supplementary thing that you might do the drive the, the driver is actually that we want people to just to use their town center to be able to meet the friends and you know um and just have those chance meetings and just to enjoy the space and whilst they're there there may be these other supplementary things that go on um, or you may be working there and therefore you need certain things, to, amenities to help your, your, your working day flow better. Uh, but certainly from a residential point of view, from a residence point of view, we want people to come into our public spaces to be able to sit down, whether it's on the grass, whether it's on a bench. Um, and we're very mindful in terms of the, the furniture and how that needs to be inclusive. Um, you know, and we, we, we've stakeholders in terms of disability groups so that we can understand what what it would be helpful for, for and that's just one example I guess that, that there are others. Well that's our time so it just leaves me to thank you Andrea for your presentation thank you. and thank you very much to our judges they've got more work to do after this because they need to make their decision on who uh, will be the winners of the golden pineapple for a future place. So um, that concludes today's program. We are back tomorrow at 10 o'clock and all day in the morning. We are going to have four neighborhoods vying for place of the year, followed by a lunchtime talk with writer Owen Hatherley. And in the afternoon, we have six projects competing uh, for the Golden Pineapple for public space. So it's the same link as today. We will see you then. And um, in the meantime, this has been Festival of Place, the pineapples. And uh, now we're going to go and deliberate. So see you tomorrow.